So hello everyone, it is an honor to be standing in front of you people today. I have wondered more often than not that while I have been blessed with a life full of abundance, of love and comfort and most importantly resources, there are too many to count souls who can only dream of a life of resources. The Almighty works in mysterious ways, ladies and gentlemen. So much so that in the court of God, where humans before birth are given the means and modes of survival on this planet, I like to believe that the advocate representing humans is either substandard or that poor fellow is highly underpaid. Because what else explains the unequal distribution of resources amongst people? This very question, this very thought has urged me, it keeps urging me to devise some idea, some plan, so as to bring the disadvantaged at par with the resourceful lot of the society. And let me make it very clear to you, ladies and gentlemen, before we tread any further, that I'm not a socialist, I'm not a communist, and I'm not pro-reservation. I'm definitely not pro-reservation. On the contrary, I believe that it is a strong foundation, a strong platform that these disadvantaged people need to themselves build a life for themselves. And the foundation that I can provide them with the skills and means that I've acquired being an engineer is power. And with power here, I refer not just to the literal power electricity, but the metaphorical power knowledge. Because I'm sure all of us present would acknowledge that knowledge is power. So in pursuit of chasing this dream to pa give power to the powerless, I got associated with Gram Power, which is doing a phenomenal job at rural electrification, amongst other cool things. Let me give you a brief overview of what we actually do at Gram Power. So we find the most remotest and the exotic, most exotic of villages, which are yet unelectrified in our country. We visit these villages, we spend a good chunk of our time doing community mobilization, engaging with the community, raising awareness, and most importantly, convincing them to take up our systems. And not to forget numerous instances of braving lashing rains, risking flowing into, can you turn on the slide show please? Risking flowing into ferocious rivers, that's me trying to save myself from the ferocious river, and visiting villages which are infamous for cases of kidnapping. So over time, over time and upon spending a good chunk of our time there, we commission a microgrid in those villages, thereby electrifying the village. Does that ring a bell to anyone? Some movie that you saw some 10 years back, where an NRI decides to come back to our country. <laughs> oh, very learned people, good job. <laughs> so yes, uh, an NRI comes back to India to electrify a village. Well, there are no points for guessing. You guys are awesome. Yes, so uh, this is exactly what we do. And it goes without saying that we Indians are highly influenced by movies, especially Bollywood movies. And many a time, our decisions are taken, are influenced by that one scene that we, that, that we saw in that movie. So I would urge our filmmakers to make good and sensible movies. The, the country's future is in their hands. Uh, well, upon, during uh, one of the earliest missions of my life, uh, called Engineering in India, <laughs> I'm sure all engineers present here would relate with me on that. But yeah, that's a different TED talk altogether, some other time maybe. Yes. So during one of the earliest missions of my life called Engineering India, I was deeply impacted by this movie. And I believe even uh, the President of the United States, Mr. Barack Obama, could not resist Mr. Shah Rukh Khan's charm at a recent CD4 event. So me being an Indian, I had no other option but to succumb to it. So I gave up a life of travel, of a well-paid job, of comfort, and I decided to give back to the society, to we, the people. Allow me to define the talk further. How many people do you reckon do not have access to power in our country? In our country alone? Anyone? 300 million people in our country do not have access to power. 300 million people, ladies and gentlemen. Can any of us imagine a life without electricity? In the age of internet, smartphones, Mangalyans, India shining, there are people in our country who do not have access to power. As a matter of utter disappointment, 
300 million people who do not have access to power are living a powerless life. So our motto at Gram Power is to empower. It is to electrify India intelligently. I believe that with the advent of electric power in these villages, it is not, this, it is not that just electricity reaches these villages. We do a lot more. Electric power can therefore bring electronic media into these villages. Imagine all these social awareness campaigns, these welfare schemes that are initiated by the government. What kind of an impact will they actually have when, they're actually, when they actually reach to the endpoint consumers that are the rural consumers? And we have to acknowledge for a fact that electronic media is the most powerful media. I'm sure all these TED Talks are as intriguing for the fact that you can hear and see the speakers and do not have to read an article somewhere. So one solution that we provide to give energy access to these rural consumers is through the commissioning of microgrids. Now a microgrid comprises of the generation system and the distribution infrastructure all situated locally in a village. Now in a microgrid, the power is generated in a village, it is distributed in a village and it is consumed in a village. I know for a fact that there are a lot of villages in our country which do not have access to electricity because of their geographical locations. Villages which are too far, which is villages that fall under forest area, villages that are too far for the utility grid to reach them because it is unviable. So for such villages, microgrids are a blessing because it is only through microgrids that you can viably electrify these villages. So that is what we've been doing, ladies and gentlemen. So there, power given to these villages. So there is now power, there's convenience, there's facilities, everything, what not. But this is where the hitch lies. Picture this, what would I do if I wake up as Superman one morning? I mean, what would any of you uh, do if you wake up as Superman? Obviously, the women will wake up as Wonder Women. But yes, what would I do if I wake up as Superman one morning? I would be tempted to use my powers in any which random ways possible and also misuse them to my convenience. So what happens when you give power to these powerless villages? What happens when you give them this elusive, precious power? They misuse it. These villagers, naive though they may be, interestingly learn to exploit the facility being relayed to them very quickly. As we like to call them at Grampar, electrifying these villagers brings the Teslas in these villagers to life. You can call them Einsteins, you can call them anything you want, as long as you, think, as, as long as you know that what I mean by Teslas is that they're stealing power. They start stealing power. So what is the solution that we provide? So the solution that we provide is a smart meter and a theft detection system. Because we realized, in the light of recent development in technology, the concept, the concept needed some revamping. So a smart meter, which is a smart prepaid meter actually. Now a smart prepaid meter works exactly the same way as a prepaid phone would. You get a recharge done, you use electricity. As simple as that. Imagine all the hassles of monthly bill payments and issues related to transparency and fairness of the bill, all taken care of by the smart meter, which is prepaid. In addition to that, a smart meter, not just is prepaid, it helps, it gives the consumers, the rural consumers that we're dealing with, it gives them a real-time, very simple, but powerful information about their consumption. Suppose they put on any, they start any bulb, they, they put on any appliance. This meter on the display right there, it tells them exactly how many hours they can run it for. Now suppose if they turn on an incandescent bulb, it will definitely give a shorter number of hours duration. But instead, if they turn on an LED, which is energy, energy efficient, it gives more hours left for, for the appliance to run. So this way, we're also actually helping consumers use energy efficient appliances. But how do we step, stop theft from happening in these villages? Because that is one of the primary concerns of our country, preventing power theft. This is where a smart theft detection system comes into picture, ladies and gentlemen. A th now, since I've told you that in a microgrid, the generation and the consumption takes place locally in these villages. So these villagers know exactly the amount of electricity that they're going to consume. Now, for any day, 
if the supposed consumption and the actual consum consumption, and there's a mismatch between them, an acute mismatch, we realize that there's theft rampant in that village and the system shuts down. So we at Grandpa have been successfully able to create a dent on like power theft, something that the state electric boards can take a cue from. But do you people think that only technology and technology alone can ensure the sustainability and scalability of any model? No, we've got to back it with the right social tools. Allow me to ask you a question. How many of us repair a broken road? How many of us repair any government property, property for that matter? Yes, we do pay taxes, but let us not fall into that domain tonight. That's another TED talk again. So yes, what do we do? Do we really take care of things that are not ours? The point I'm trying to make here is that we don't really take care of something that we don't love. A mother loves her child, that's why she takes care of her. A bouncer hits on Sachin Tendulkar's helmet and the entire country winces and prays for him because we love him. That is the kind of model that we, kind of, we might want to replicate in these villages. Since these villages, again, are located remotely and locally in these villages, the people, the consumers, think of the plant as their own. They take care of it as their own baby. They run the entire show. We just, we just monitor, we just guide them, but it is entirely run by them. We appoint op operators there, which collect the monthly rentals and stuff. So yes, I mean, it is completely their show, thereby giving them access to real power. And apart from that, the other thing that we've done is we've transferred the systems to them on lease. After numerous community mobilization activities, we transfer the systems to them so that they take care of the plant themselves for a period of five years. And trust me, ladies and gentlemen, this has given us very good results. <coughs> so I've talked about a lot of things. I've talked about smart meters. I've talked about a lot of things, actually. But then, and I've, I've also told you that I've, we visited numerous, countless villages in our country which are yet unelectrified. And definitely there are lovely experiences associated with all those visits. But there's one that stands out, and I would like to share that with you. During one of these visits, I happened to be in the company of a very old man, an 83-year-old man, actually. He was brutally honest enough to tell me that he did not trust me. He said, I don't trust you, I don't think electricity is ever going to come to my village, because since birth, and he's an 83-year-old man, since birth, I've been waiting for electricity to come to my village. And four generations have passed, but nothing has happened yet. He told me, I don't really believe that you'll be able to bring power to my village. That day I realized that these people living in the remotest parts of our country have lost faith in the system. Faith that electricity will ever come to their village. Faith that they will have access to the same resources as we privileged ones have. I've, sh I've, sh I've told you that how difficult it is to actually reach these villages and do the work there. But I'd like to rephrase that. So while I've told you that I've visited villages and we've braved lashing rains, we've risked drowning into rivers, but we've also seen women celebrate the first train of the season. While we visited, while we visited uh, villages and we've al almost risked getting kidnapped, we've also been blessed and loved by people like those 83-year-old men who probably is glued to a television set right now. So we've been blessed by those people as well. So I would like to urge you, I would like to say that it is time that we send a message to these people, that we think of them as our own. Message that we really care. A message that equal accessibility is something that, will, that they will also get very soon. Because sometimes, some, doing something is not just important. Sometimes, sometimes people need more. They, need, they deserve to have their faith rewarded. In the end, I would like to tell you people, I would like to ask you people rather, that what is it that you're going to take home from this talk? I don't want to overload you with baggage. Just want to tell you that, please take home this idea that equal accessibility and inclusive growth is the need of the hour. And by equal accessibility, I mean access to justice, 
access to vision, access to computers, access to resources, and ladies and gentlemen, access to power. Thank you.